Dick Feynman was a very unique human being. He was also a very unique physicist. He was also a friend of mine. He was a deeply, deeply human person. In fact, there was something sad about him. He touched me very, very deeply. A good part of my own internal life still revolves around the things that I did, said, talked about with Dick. I think because he was so unique and because I was his friend, I sometimes get asked to speak about him. This is the second time that I've spoken about him in this particular room with an audience of about this size. The last time was a TED conference devoted to Dick. And what I chose to speak about at that time was basically my friendship with him. What we talked about, the things that, uh, that we found in common. He was a good deal older than me, but still, we managed to resonate and have a very nice time together. This time, I decided what I wanted to talk about. Well, first of all, when I started to write the talk for this, uh, I had forgotten pretty much what I talked about the last time. And when I looked at what I wrote, and then took a look at what was on the internet, what I'd spoken about before was practically identical, and I said, no, no, I can't do that. <laughs> so what I decided to talk about was not Dick, the friend of mine, but Dick, the physicist. Dick's way of doing physics and his style, his scientific style, every, every, every um, physicist, every scientist, everybody, I think, has their own style. Uh, Dick's was extremely distinctive. But again, when I started to think about Dick as a scientist, I realized I couldn't separate him from Dick the man, Dick the personality. They were too closely connected. Dick the personality, Dick the performer, Dick the physicist, they were all one. They were the same thing. So I'll try to tell you a little bit. Now, most of what I'm going to talk about took place before I knew him. So I'm surmising to a large extent. But it was reinforced by what I learned over the last 10 or 15 years of his life when we became friends. Dick was, in all things, a trickster. He loved to take some very difficult problem and find a trick to solve it. A trick meant some simple way to think about it that nobody had thought about because they were all thinking in complicated, highly technical ways. And he managed to penetrate through with some very simple insight and solve the problem. Not only did he like to solve the problem, but he liked to tell you how he solved the problem. He liked to tell you how easy it was, if you were as smart as Dick Feynman. <laughs> was there ego there? You betcha there was ego there, <laughs> lots of it. But it was also the way he thought. I have a feeling that the way he thought about physics was in terms of how you explain it. And in his mind were always explanations and ego. His most important contribution, or at least his most famous contribution to physics, was the diagrammatic approach to quantum electrodynamics. In 1949, Feynman, Schwinger, and Tomonaga invented what is called modern quantum field theory. No one knew how quantum mechanics and special relativity fit together. The reason was that space-time in the special theory of relativity is infinitely divisible, divisible into arbitrarily small little pieces. Wheels within wheels within wheels ad infinitum. And something was going on at every one of these scales. At every scale, at every distance scale, things were going on. The question was, how do you separate out from this infinitely complex system of wheels within wheels the things that you're actually interested in, the things that take place at a scale that you're interested in, atoms, for example? Well, Feynman, Schwinger, and Tomonaga solved the problem, but in very, very different ways. Now, unfortunately, I never had an opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to study Tomonaga's work. I'm told that it was quite a bit like uh, Schwinger's work. But at least Schwinger's work and Feynman's work were so different, at least in presentation, that you could hardly tell that they were talking about the same thing. Schwinger's papers were crystalline pieces of art, almost. 
Equation followed equation followed equation and a kind of rigorous progression that led to a structure. The structure got bigger and more elaborate and formed a beautiful logical structure. The only problem with it is it was totally opaque and incomprehensible, at least to most people. One thing that was true about Schwinger's papers is they had no pictures. They were hard to understand. And it was hard to work with his methods. It was hard to see through what was going on. Feynman was almost exactly the opposite. He had pictures in his head. Pictures of electrons moving through space, moving backward and forward through space, emitting and absorbing photons. And he knew how to convert those pictures into little equations, into equations. But they were very, very simple. Almost a tinker toy kind of picture of how to put things together to make elaborate, complicated processes, but out of very simple elements. The elements were called vertices and propagators. I've, I'm going to teach you a little bit of physics while we're going on, not much because we don't have time. What is it? An electron comes in, an electron goes out, and it emits a photon. You can read it in different ways. You can look at it, electron goes to electron with a photon emitted, or you can read it sideways, an electron and a positron come in and make a photon, or you can read it backward, photon makes an electron and proton, po positron, excuse me, all the same vertex. There was a mathematical structure associated with it. It was called a gamma matrix, a Dirac matrix, and that's all that the vertex was. Then there were propagators. Propagators basically represented the traveling of a particle from one point to another. There was an electron propagator that told you how an electron goes from one place to another, and again, a mathematical expression associated with it, and a photon propagator. You put these things together and make processes out of them. For example, here were two vertices connected by a photon propagator. That corresponded to a scattering of an electron. Here's another example. An electron comes in, a photon comes in, they join at a vertex, the electron keeps going, and eventually this picture represents the scattering of a photon by an electron. This one comes straight out of Feynman's paper. I think it was his first paper on quantum electrodynamics, if I'm not mistaken. It looks rather cluttered, a lot of, a lot of stuff going on, but in fact, this simple picture actually contained the entire set of rules of calculation of quantum electrodynamics. That's how simple it was, or at least that's how simple Feynman's rules were. I learned these things. Incidentally, when Feynman did this, I was nine years old. It took uh, another few years before I got to the point where I was learning quantum electrodynamics. I read Feynman's papers. They were lots of fun. You had these rules. You could do things with them. You could calculate things. You could compare them with experiment. I wasn't comparing them with experiment, but you could. It was easy and fun and intuitive, but I was uneasy about it a little bit. The reason I was uneasy about it is I couldn't really figure out where the rules came from. Did they come from some basic formulas like Schwinger was working for, with? I couldn't tell. It was just too hard to tell, and I was disturbed by it, and I was un uneasy about it. Well, fortunately for me, and I think for a whole generation of physicists, Somebody else had put the ideas together and managed to understand exactly how to go from Schwinger's deep fundamental principles to Feynman's tricks to Feynman's diagrams. Who was that somebody? Well, you just heard him speak a moment ago. It was Freeman Dyson. And Dyson, Feynman, Schwinger, and Tomonaga laid the basis for quantum electrodynamics, for quantum field theory, and for our own entire future understanding of particle physics. That was Feynman's perhaps most important discovery in physics. Um, and you can kind of see the trickery, the trickster, the magician working. My guess is that when, I, I don't really know this, but I suspect when Feynman first presented these ideas, I suspect the formal mathematical physicists were somewhat appalled by them. Why? Again, because he was this young guy that nobody knew come along and say, here's the rules. If you don't like them, lump them. I, yeah, I made them up, but they work. <laughs>
Uh, I, I don't know that that's really true. Maybe Freeman knows. I don't know what the, what the response to, uh, to uh, Feynman was. But I get the feeling that, uh, that he was full of chutzpah, and uh, it took some time, I suspect, for people to realize <laughs> that he actually knew what he was talking about. That was Feynman's first contribution. Now let me come to another one. I want to just do a couple of examples of a Feynman kind of thinking. Um, the second thing that I would mention and talk about a little bit has to do with helium, a very, very dull substance. It doesn't do very much, but when it's cold, it behaves in incredible ways. It's called superfluid liquid helium, and superflu superfluid liquid helium has amazing properties. It flows without friction, it climbs up walls, it forms vortices and uh, sort of smoke ring-like objects and so forth. In 1941, Lev Landau from the Soviet Union had put together the first real theory of superfluidity, but it was a funny theory in which assumptions which were made, which nobody had any reason to believe ought to be true other than that they worked. It was a kind of ad hoc theory. Uh, it was called the two fluid theory. Nobody really understood it. That was 1941. But by around 1950, a method was being used. The method was the method of perturbation theory. Perturbation theory didn't work very well. Why? Because perturbation theory was based on an assumption. The assumption was that the helium atoms were far enough apart that they only now and then interacted with each other. He liquid helium is nothing like that. Liquid helium is dense. The atoms are packed together. They're constantly hitting each other. And the theory didn't, didn't work very well. But what was this perturbation theory? This perturbation theory was basically Feynman diagrams tailored or adjusted to be able to be used for helium. Along comes Feynman. What does Feynman do? Well, what he doesn't do is to use Feynman diagrams. He had another method of doing physics. It went something like this. You close your eyes and you think about what the phenomena do. You think about the phenomena directly. And then you get a picture and when you get a picture, you try to make some mathematics out of it. Feynman thought about what the wave function, what the quantum state of a collection, a dense collection of helium atoms would look like. That's my picture. That's my picture. I closed my eyes and made that picture. <laughs> I think it's pretty, pretty similar, I suspect, to what Feynman's would have looked like. Helium atoms jostling around close enough together that they're always bumping into each other. And he said, let me try to th think about what the quantum state of this is like. Now, people had, the, he was not the first to think about this. I forget the people who actually thought about it first. But he said, here are some properties of the wave function. First of all, the wave function is a function of a huge number of variables, namely the positions of all of the molecules, 10 to the 23rd or 10 to the 24th molecules, an enormous thing that no, no, no couldn't be written on a piece of paper, but it couldn't even be stored in the biggest computer in the world, the biggest computer in the world now. Uh, I don't even think it would be stored in the biggest uh, quantum computer when it's made. An enormously complicated thing, but he had some hints. The first is that the helium molecules repel each other, and that meant the wave function should go to zero when the molecules touch. Okay? That was the first hint. The second hint is that the wave function B should be a very smoothly, slowly varying thing. That keeps its energy low. Uh, the most important fact was that the wave function is a symmetric function of all of the positions. That's because the particles are bosons. Now, if that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. I'm not going to use it. I'm just going to tell you here was this thing that Feynman thought about essentially by closing, I don't know if he really closed his eyes, of course, but by closing his eyes and thinking what the phenomena were like, not thinking about fancy mathematics, but what does it look like? Of course, he was talking about what a very complicated wave function looked like. Surprisingly, just these thoughts alone easily 
easily produced all of the phenomena of liquid helium, easily if you were Feynman. He managed to explain almost anything. Let me give you one example. Why does helium flow so easily? Why doesn't it have friction? Well, the reason it didn't have friction was because there were very, very few ways. The friction means something perturbs the, uh, the fluid, vibrates it, oscillates it. There were very, very few ways that this fluid could, oscillate, or could, could change. For example, you might think about changing it by stirring it. Here I've imagined the group of molecules that I've labeled in pink, another group of molecules or atoms that I've labeled in green, and you might think that you could stir it around in such a way as to interchange the pink and the green molecules just by a little stirring motion. Uh, you might think you could exchange them. But because the wave function is symmetric, because the particles are bosons, when you do move the molecules around like that and interchange them, you just come back to exactly the same thing you started with. It is not a new state. Feynman realized that the paucity of such quantum states was the underlying reason that the helium behaved with such a lack of friction. He did a lot of things like that with helium, understood a great deal about it, it's kind of interesting to imagine Feynman uh, presenting this to the experts on helium. By this time, he was, of course, a famous physicist. Uh, so I don't think that anybody uh, was um, doubting him. But on the other hand, it must have come like something of a shock to the people who had been doing this very elaborate other mathematical methods that somebody could see through it with such clarity. Again, tricks but profound tricks. The last example I'm going to talk about comes from around 1968. I was already 28 years old at that time. I was a young assistant professor of physics. And in fact, the things he was thinking about then were very, very closely related to things I was thinking about. And so I know about them firsthand. It has to do with the proton. The proton is a particle, of course, and it's a particle of a class that are called hadrons. Hadrons are not simple elementary particles. They are made of lots of other small particles, smaller than they are themselves. Now, today we call those particles quarks and gluons. In 1968, people already knew about quarks, and maybe it's not so much about gluons, but Feynman didn't want to commit himself to what the proton was made of. And so he just called them by a name that he made up. He called them partons. Parton for part, like the part of a proton. Uh, nobody knew too much about these partons, but experiments were going on. Experiments were going on at the Stanford Linear Accelerator to bombard the proton with electrons. Hit them with electrons and see what comes out, or see how the electron behaves after it bombards the proton, and you'll learn something about the structure of the proton. There was an army of people calculating how protons and electrons should collide with each other. And what were they using? What was the technique that they were using? Raise your hand if you think you know. Oh, I'll tell you. Feynman diagrams. Feynman diagrams. The problem was that the proton is composed of all these particles, which very much like the liquid helium, were bouncing around and colliding with each other intensely in such a way that as the electron passed through the proton, so much was going on, so many collisions of the partons themselves, that the Feynman diagrams became incredibly complicated, a nightmare to try to calculate the Feynman diagrams. Well, a trick was needed. The trick that both Feynman, and I'm glad to say I also thought of, was to use the special theory of relativity. In the special theory of relativity, you can examine a thing from any frame of reference. And if you go to the frame of reference where the proton is moving very fast, the proton is moving to the right with extremely large velocity, the partons are moving also to the right, Lorentz and Einstein told us that something happens to the picture of the proton, it gets squashed, pancaked, collapsed into a flat pancake. It's called Lorentz contraction. Now, that in itself was not terribly helpful, 
But something else happens. It's called time dilation. The internal motions, the relative motions of all of the partons and substructure slows down. That meant in such a frame, the proton was, a, was an object which didn't have a lot going on in it. And if you study the proton in that frame and collide it with an electron, you get to think of each of the partons as frozen. You hit them one at a time. And what happens when the electron, that's the purple line, hits the proton, hits the proton is it hits a parton and knocks it out. That was the whole theory. There was no more to it. That was the whole theory that Feynman used to analyze the experiments that were going on at Slack, and it was extremely effective. Extremely effective. And again, he had found a trick that well, it might have embarrassed a few people, but it also excited a lot of people and made things easy. There was another person who was also involved in this, I should say. I should just tell you who it was. It was a physicist, a good friend of both of ours, by the name of James Burkane. James Burkane was also another physicist who knew how and knows how to think simply and had a very similar picture. Those are the examples that I wanted to show you about how Feynman thought. And uh, the performer, the magician, and the physicist were sort of all one. A very special thing. Now, was it all fun and games? Was it all tricks? Was it all? No, of course, there were deep insights that Feynman had. Was it all ego? No. Feynman had a deep lesson that he was trying to teach people. He was a teacher, among other things. He wanted to teach the lesson that the jargon, the mumbo jumbo, the overly precious mathematics, the overly abstract mathematics, generally did not help you think about phenomena. The way to think about phenomena, well, maybe you don't close your eyes, but you think about the phenomena themselves, and then you convert it to mathematics. You use the simplest tools that you can. Whatever the simplest tools are, if you use those, you will learn the most about the physics. This was the legacy of Feynman, I believe, and it's a legacy which I hope does not get lost. Everybody, every young physicist knows about Feynman, but do they know what he really stood for? Simplicity, honesty, and a way of thinking which focused on the phenomena themselves rather than the fancy mathematics. Incidentally, one last thing. Somebody has already mentioned that Feynman was, in fact, very philosophical, despite the fact that he claimed to hate philosophy, and he was indeed the most philosophical physicist I've ever known. He also claimed to dislike mathematics. He was the most mathematical physicist I knew. But he knew how to use it, and he knew how to use the simplest bits of it to get the most far-reaching conclusions. Thank you. <laughs>